Well, to me, it's like I, I, I've not done enough. And I feel responsible to build the legacy, to have that American dream, and to create opportunity for our children and other children of our tribe. Hello, I'm Kimberly Acosta with IndianCountryTV.com, and I'm here with Delbert Wheeler and the Yakima Reservation on Howard Lake. You want to tell us about what Howard Lake means to you? Howard Lake's a place that we spend most of our summers, and here we come and we gather our berries every year, and we actually do a lot of hunting out of here. We spend probably about two months of our time here with our family. And you've been coming here since you were young, correct? So I was a little boy. So I can remember. Can you tell us about the, you had pointed out earlier, the Thunderbirds? There's a natural Thunderbird made out of the rock formations. There's three of them up here on the hillside. You can see in... Can you tell us who Delbert Whaler is? Where you said that you grew up with your grandparents? Yes, I was raised by my grandparents since I was three days old. And you went to school up until eighth grade? Yes. And what changed all then? What happened in eighth grade that you stopped going to school? Did you come out here and... Well, a lot of things changed and how I felt about things and, and disagreements with the educational system and history and a lot of things that rose a lot of question in my mind. And you set out and began working and started creating your own businesses at a very young age. What inspired you to keep going after everything you were going through? To think about going out and starting a business and working like you did? Well, it was hard to find a job being a Native American on your own land. And there wasn't too much opportunity. And I went to a lot of logging companies because I wanted to really be a logger. I wanted to work in the woods because I spent all my life in the woods. That's where I wanted to be was in these mountains. What can you tell us about these mountains when you were young, spending time here? What was it like? You got to be who you were. You weren't dealing with all the pressures and of being a young person in, in a city or in a town. You're dealing with nature. Um, you feel a connection to the earth here. You feel a connection to the animals, to everything that's here. And um, it seemed like it was just like your calling to be here. And it seemed like um, a lot of the peer pressures that children deal with today, back then, I didn't have to deal with some of those being here. It was kind of like I was just a young man and learning and enjoying life and fishing, hunting, gathering our berries and camping and spending a lot of productive time with my family, with my parents and sitting by the fire and listening to a lot of stories and legends and things that actually make you who you are. And give you that foundation of beliefs that you have. Can you share with us your family tree in regards to Kamaikin? And also, I know that you named your son after him, your, one of your older sons, Kamaikin. Can you yes. tell us the history of where your family tree is in regards to it? I come from the family tree of um, Nathan only in 1855. There was a daughter born. Her name was Melvina only. At that time, Nathan only left his wife at that time, which was Jeanette Halaquilla, who was one of the ladies that was going to marry Kamayak, and she comes from Chief Chalalit, from the Salilo Falls area. And at that time, he had a daughter with him, with her, which her name was Melvina. And that daughter the story told from our grandfather was the daughter of Kamaikan, and that's the lineage that they came from. And they didn't come from the only side. They came from the Jeanette Halaquilla and the Kamaikan side. And can you tell us a little bit about K 
Mikan, he was the one that they, in regards to the 1855 treaty? Well, he was an inspiration to me in the stories that I heard about Kamaikan from my grandfather and the things that he told me that went on in the treaties, negotiations, and he also had a grandfather whose name was Abe Lincoln, who was one of the people that surveyed this land out, this reservation, and actually set it up for our people. And he was an enrolled member of the Yakima Nation. And he died in um, about 1928. And you talked a lot about, you had talked about how in your one video that we watched, about how you went through a period with drinking and drugs and same with a lot of the people that worked with you, that were employed with you, and you took that step to get sober and clean and go to treatment, and you also helped your employees. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I went to treatment in October of 1991. I've been sober since then. Um, I've been sober since my birth date's November 3rd, 1991. I call that my date. Um, it seemed like I had a lot of struggles inside of me. Um, couldn't follow the right path getting off and wasn't able to um, function properly. And I grew up with parents that were alcoholics and a lot of aunts and uncles that were alcoholics in my family. And it was one thing that I never wanted to be or betray. And I believe that um, during that time I came to a lot of realization and I went to treatment and it opened my eyes to a lot of things that I really wasn't seeing clearly. And so at that time, when I got out, I had a meeting with the company and told them that we had a lot of people missing work and a lot of people that weren't able to create that healthiness in their family atmosphere because most of us were dysfunctional. And so I told them in order for us all to become healthy, we were all going to have to place ourselves in treatment and to look towards that healthy way and lead as examples and to be good examples was to walk that sober red road. You have, since you were young, seems to have been successful at working on building the American dream. Can you share with us why that was important for you in regards to your community here? It seems like you've created a lot of jobs and Well, to me, it's like I, I, I've not done enough. And I feel responsible to build the legacy, to have that American dream, and to create opportunity for our children and other children of our tribe. Because we didn't grow up real wealthy people, but we were self-sustaining, and we never went hungry. And um, today, I see a lot of kids go hungry. And I see a lot of kids that look at life and it seems to end at 14 and 16 and 18 years old because they, can, they can't foresee a future, a destiny for themselves or a self-worth, are able to take care of their children because you have children having children. I mean, people in our reservation become parents at 13 years old. And how can they take care of a child when they're a child? And they have no way of having any employment or sustaining any kind of income that can actually manage a household. And so it, it's things that we need to be taught and it's things that we need to learn. And at a young age, I had, young, I had children. And I loved those children more than I loved myself. So. I did what I needed to do to feed my family and to take care of my children. And it's really hard today because in the system, the system does not work for our, for our people. 
You seem to have run into a lot of roadblocks. What has kept you going? Most people would quit and give up. What has kept you going? Probably the way I grew up and the things that my father taught me, my grandfather and my grandmother, and the foundation that they built. I was able to see a healthy family. I was able to work for everything that I wanted. And they indoctrinated work, into, work ethics into our lives. And they told us that no matter what, these things would take care of you, and they have. And, you know, most of the time, my largest fights have been with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the federal government, or the states, the states in general, but mostly the state of Washington. And all these issues have come against us, and they continuously do, but they actually are against our treaty that protects us, or supposedly protects us. And when it states that this 1.4 million acres is for our exclusive right use and benefit with no impediments or no fees put upon us, that's what it means. But then this 1.4 has been checkerboarded and you see a lot of non-Indian people come here and benefit off our land when our people aren't able to benefit off our land. And then we become stagnant and we become more like the day that they came here and they told us that now we're going to take care of you so you all get in line to get your flour and to get your mush. And it's kind of like that's how they've tried to bring us to be and it doesn't fit no more because now they can't sustain that to our people and to our children and it doesn't work. And it says we have a right to go and hunt and fish and to trade and travel in our natural and accustomed places. Well, that's this whole Turtle Island through Canada, through the United States. We traded with all different nations, the Onondagas, the Oneidas, the Cheyenne, the Lakotas, the Blackfeet, the Yakimas decrees and all these things now the states want to put a hold on it and the government does because they know that if they honor the treaty it'll give us a way to sustain our land holdings and to be able to become productive in, in, the, in the, a productive American or a productive person in this society and be able to take care of our families and that's not what they want. They want us to feel that we have to feed off them and that they're always controlling and making our decisions. And how can people come here and go to school somewhere else and be sent here from New York or California or for San Francisco or LA and they're non-Indians, they don't know our culture, they don't know what we feel, the connection we have with this land and who we are and they come here and they tell us hey, well, this is how you're supposed to be, but yet the only opportunity they're given is to people that they believe that are big companies, are corporations, are, are productive people already in society instead of teaching our people to be productive people in our own society. And that's not what the treaty stated. You it's continue to pass that culture and... Uh information on your treaty down to your children and your grandchildren? Yes, my, all my children know the treaty. What kind of legacy would you like to leave for your children and your grandchildren and right on down the line? What's your, your hopes and your dreams for them? With all the fights that you have been dealing with to try and keep the recognition of your treaty. Well, it's not just a treaty, it's the legacy of who they are and to not forget who they are but also to be able to um, have an American dream to be able to sustain their families in the future and those yet not born and um, 
their children after that and their grandchildren after that, that they will be able to live as productive people in this society and to actually continue to have a foundation of where they come from, who they are, and that there's values there. And those values that they're going to be able to carry with them for the rest of their life. Leave us with one message, John. Where are you going from here? Will you continue to fight the fight to take, to keep your culture and your way of life? Yeah, I will. I'll continue the fight. And it's a scary fight. I don't have a choice but to continue the fight. I'm already there. Not by my choice not by my reasoning, because in everything I've done, I think that I followed the law. And it gets confusing to me because we're raised on the Yakima Indian Reservation to follow our treaty. Now, our treaty states a lot of things. It states the 1.4 million acres for our exclusive right use and benefits. Article 2 and 3 states that we have a right to gather our foods and to hunt in our natural and custom places, to trade and travel to our natural and custom places. Feeless, with no impediments put upon us. Now, all these things means taxes and different things like that. Well, I'm not into... Um, looking at it in any other way. I don't see the state coming here and funding our children, or funding the school for our children, or taking care of the messes that our children are in. I don't see them coming and putting up a drug awareness program that's going to create a treatment center for our children. All these taxes that are paid does not benefit the Yakima Nation. And why are we allowing the tax money on our 1.4 million acres to go anywhere else but to our 1.4 million acres. There's Safeway, there's 7-Eleven, there's all these stores that sit in that 1.4 million acres who are paying taxes to the state. Well, those taxes should be paid to the Yakima Nation because they set and reside within our boundaries. But no, they're not. And the state's out there saying, well, we want to be paid for every non-Indian that buys fuel or cigarettes or a candy bar from an Indian store, a native store. We want that tax to be paid to us. But the Indian that buys the candy bar, he doesn't have, the, not, the Indian buys the candy bar, you can keep that tax dollar. Well, what's it benefit our store? The treaty says the 1.4 million acres belongs to us for our exclusive right use and benefit. Not to the state, not to the government, not to anybody because we're a sovereign nation. And, and our sovereignty means that we are sovereign. That all those things that we have has to come back to our people and to benefit our people in one way or another. I guess that's a $20 question. <laughs> You know, and, um, and it also states in our treaty that we're not to appear in court. But all of our rights are appearing in court. We're supposed to meet with the President of the United States. It says, meet with the Great White Father in any differences that we have to work those things out between us, government to government relationship. But the President, he... He keeps denying to meet with us. He keeps refusing to. Because why? He doesn't want to honor the paper that he signed. He doesn't want to guarantee the rights that he guaranteed our people. So he develops the Department of Interior. He develops the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And he takes all Indians, treaty or non-treaty, state-recognized, federally-recognized tribes, treaty-recognized tribes, and he wants to throw us all into one bucket and treat us all the same. So a non-Indian company might go over here and get in a fight in a lawsuit 
over an Indian right and lose that right, then that right sets down, it's set down as a foundation that that right rules over all Indians. Well, how can that be? When there's tribes that have treaties that actually outline those issues and lay them out and say that this is why. But yet, federal law says, no, this is the case that sets precedence for all Indians. And this is how we're treated time after time. And, and yeah, there's a lot of unfairness. There's a lot of unjust. And do I believe in the court system that we're going to get a fair shake? No, because the court system's not about justice. Delbert Wheeler says, I decide that I read my treaty, and in my treaty it states that I'm untaxable. So I'm not going to pay this tax. So what happens? Instead of it becoming a civil issue and me going to fight this tax issue, the federal government raids me with 80 federal agents, 30 agents outside of my home with fully automatic weapons. And they come and they put my employees on the floor at gunpoint and they treat us like we're a drug dealer or something. When we're, a, when we're an honorable business doing business and, and we're not breaking the law, we refuse something because it is our right. And then we're treated like a criminal, and instead of discussing why we're untaxable and why we're not taxable, it's actually, we're thrown with 50 different charges. Like, all of a sudden, we're CCTA, we're fraud and wire fraud for money that's being wired to our accounts, which a normal business does. All of a sudden, we're tax evading. We didn't tax evade because we actually were paid up on all the taxes at the time. But when they came and they took our money from our accounts and our receivables, they leaned all of our receivables and then took those too. Yeah, then you're going to get behind. So they created a good and an honest business to become delinquent in all these areas because we were still continuing the fight and we're going to still continue to fight and the horrible part about it now is that you know if we lose the fight a lot of people are going to hurt I don't know what's going to happen to me I don't know what's going to happen to my son or some people that work for us How many people work for you right now in all your businesses? About 190. When King Mountain was doing what it was doing in the height of everything, we employed 400 people just at King Mountain Tobacco. And King Mountain Tobacco itself is down to about 150 people. And in, in, our, in our stores, in, an, in our farming, in our logging, we employ about 40 more people. But if we were doing... In, and 80% of those are all are Yakima? 80% are enrolled members of the Yakima Nation. And so you've already lost half your employment through all of this, through yeah, all the different battles. And so right now you're fighting for the other half? Actually more. We would have probably employed at this time today probably up to 1,000 employees. And it was going to create a lot of opportunity for our people and especially the people that lack education, the people that are having the issues with the drugs and the alcohol. We have an in-house counselor that basically counsels all of our employees and drug tests our employees and is able to teach them and help them to manage their lives and to manage their money so that they can become healthy. But these things now they're kind of out there in awe land because of what's going on. And um, our goal was to employ a lot of people. It was kind of the golden dream that we've been chasing and struggling to find. In 2010, we were actually going to open our treatment center in July of 2010. We had to stop everything that we were doing. Um, 
we built our business from the first year to a five million income and the second year to 11 million. The third year we jumped up to 24 million. The fourth year we jumped up to 109. In the fifth year we've seen 150 million. Now we're down to about 25 million. And that's what the government's put us at. And they took away your treatment center and pretty much took half your employees and made them jobless. And a lot of other people that we were looking forward to. I really appreciate you bringing us here to where you grew up and sharing this with us and sharing time with us. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And we're going to still continue to fight. And the horrible part about it now is that, you know, if we lose the fight, a lot of people are going to hurt. I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't know what's going to happen to my son or some people that work for us. Well, most of the time, I've spent a lot of time up here hunting and fishing, um, camping out here in the forest. The Crest Trail is approximately about three miles from here. It, the Crest Trail comes from New Mexico and travels all the way into Canada. Um, it's a wilderness area, and it's... Um, We've done a lot here. Um, one time I was up here hunting on a cliff and I shot these three mountain goats and I got surrounded by a couple hundred goats and they and my little brother was with me and they took us and they shoved us up on the edge of the cliff and they were going to push us over and um, I started talking to them and the goats let us go. <laughs> True story. <laughs> You could ask my little brother about it. It was crazy. But they were going to shove us off the cliff. And um, I just kept talking to them until they let us go. Because I could have shot a few more, but there was a couple hundred of them. It was like we weren't going to get away. And now you're being trying to, someone's trying to shove you off the cliff again. I'm used to that. <laughs>